So one of my favorite people to interview was Raymond Chow, and he was like the third person. So I just got lucky all the way around. Sometimes life is just that. Um, I'd like to think Bruce was looking over my shoulder, but it probably was just luck. <clears throat> he came down with his daughter, uh, Roberta, uh, and he sat down and he did a full 50-minute interview with me. Um, and what I thought was interesting was I wanted to get a sense of who he was. Um, and the sense I got was he was a, he was a Chinese producer and executive, which was he was very smooth. Um, and you, it, you couldn't break through the glass exterior. But even so, there were a couple details that were crucial to my understanding, particularly of Bruce's uh, last day. Um, Raymond Chow said something he'd never said before in another interview, which is that Bruce had been performing scenes from Game of Death and Kung Fu scenes, and that had made Bruce tired and dizzy. And that's not something that had never been reported before. And what led me to sort of the conclusion that it might have been a uh, heat stroke that killed him, that Bruce had been exerting himself right before he started to feel uncomfortable. Uh, and so that's one of those things that um, when he said it during the interview, I didn't think a second thought about it. And then much later, I was rereading it, and I was like, aha. And so, as you know, as a journalist, a lot of things are about mining things, and things you just think are a piece of glass turn out to be a gem much, year, much later on. So one of the great revelations for me of the book was that for decades, everyone had said that we all knew Bruce was part Eurasian, that he had, a, he had part European background, but everyone thought his grandfather was German. Uh, and it turns out that uh, that's completely incorrect. His great-grandfather was Dutch Jewish, and then the next revelation was his grandmother was 100% English. So Bruce Lee is part Dutch Jewish, part Han Chinese, and part English. And so I thought this year of all years to have a Bruce Lee conference, England could win the World Cup and get Bruce Lee. It would be a perfect year all around. I had the opportunity, uh, and I'd also say the honor, to interview Betty Ting Pei, um, because she's the last person to see him alive, and also their relationship was uh, important to both of them, particularly to Betty. Uh, Robert Chua, who was the producer for Enjoy Yourself Tonight, and was a friend of Bruce's, and has stayed very involved in the Bruce Lee world, um, arranged the interview. Uh, and it, it actually went over a three-day period. It took about 15 hours. Uh, of, of the 15 hours, maybe an hour was about Bruce, and the other 14 was about Betty's views on Buddhism and politics. And, and she has a very eclectic uh, system, of a uh, theological system, let's call it that. Uh, and so um, I sort of found her fascinating just as an individual and as a character. Uh, and I got a sense of sort of uh, her being very headstrong um, and someone who was also, the death of Bruce created a wound that she never quite healed from. Uh, and so she also loves Bruce deeply to this day. And my interview was the first time she ever admitted publicly that she had been Bruce Lee's mistress. The way she phrased it was, Matthew, I was his girlfriend. Um, and she kept, whenever I'd ask her, sort of, what happened on the last day? She said, I was his girlfriend. What do you think happened on the last day? He was at my apartment. Uh, and so I thought that was a sort of interesting way that she understood their relationship. But I was even more sort of fascinated by the degree to which he had impacted her life so that, um, you know, she spoke of him as the love of her life to this day, 40 years later, uh, in my interview with her. Probably the people I enjoyed interviewing the most in Hong Kong were Bruce's school friends. Uh, the way I came about that was um, I got in contact with the LaSalle historian who had written the book about LaSalle's history, and he revealed that the, the old boys, as they call them, uh, met about once a year. And so I went to one of their dinners and sat down with them, and no one had ever really interviewed them about Bruce Lee. And it, they were sort of fascinating because uh, they have a complicated relationship to Bruce because he's such an icon, but when they knew him as an eight, nine, ten-year-old, he was a bit of a terror. Uh, he was kind of a punk who started fights and was a, a bad student, but also quite a leader and had a following. Uh, and so they had a very complicated feeling about Bruce, and they revealed things that uh, no one had ever heard before, like why he got kicked out of LaSalle. Uh, one of the reasons was 
his PE teacher switched him with a blade of grass, and Bruce didn't like to be hit. And so he pulled out a pocket knife, flipped it open, and chased the <laughs> PE teacher across the lawn. Uh, and this is fascinating because, of course, Bruce, uh, in the movie The Orphan, 1960, pulls a blade on his teacher. And so I thought this was this amazing moment of life in imitating art and art imitating life. And that Bruce Lee, uh, that sort of uh, anger that he conveys on screen, he wasn't faking that. From a very early age, he had this kind of wellspring of anger that he could pull on. What I thought was interesting about what the old boys told me is that he was a very bright kid and a very terrible student. Um, now, he wasn't bright in the sense of mathematics. He was, his whole life he couldn't count. And frankly, when it came to money, he couldn't hold on to it. So anything that involved numbers was Bruce Lee was bad at. But he, he was actually quite good at English. Um, but he never a applied himself. And that, that, I think, was because he was hyperactive. And he just couldn't sit still in class. And his brain was going a 100 different directions. Uh, and he was one of those kids who... Today, they'd have put him on Ritalin. Um, and in China, I've always joked that Kung Fu is China's version of Ritalin. And then later in life, he discovered sort of martial arts, and that was a way to channel all that energy. But certainly when he was young, <coughs> he was a very difficult student. So William Chung and uh, Hawking's Chung are two of uh, his closest friends. Uh, I wasn't able to speak to them, but I relied on a lot of their writings. Uh, and secondary in, uh, interviews. And I think William Chung is fascinating because he's sort of Steve McQueen before Steve McQueen in the sense that William Chung was actually tougher, bigger, and stronger than Bruce Lee was. And this was when Bruce Lee really prided himself on being the toughest, strongest street fighter around. And so instead of ignoring William Chung, he wanted to figure out how to be better than him. And that's how he discovered that William Chung was studying Wing Chun under Yip Man. And so Bruce decided, if this is why he's better than me, then I'm going to go learn it until I'm better than William Chung. And so that competitive spirit that drove Bruce Lee throughout his life, you can see from a very early age from their relationship. Uh, so one of the most important things I wanted to do with this book was to t tell what Bruce's life was like as a youth. Um, most of the books give a little bit about that about Bruce Lee and then they jump immediately to his life in America because it's much easier to find English speakers to talk to and so I was really honored to have a chance to interview Phoebe and I also Robert Lee wrote a book about Bruce's youth um, and, but it's only in Chinese and so I had it translated and that was an incredible source to understand uh, what Bruce's life was like uh, as a child. Um, Phoebe said a couple interesting things about her mother um, Bruce's mother and her mother being a, a gentle, a thoughtful, quiet woman. Um, and the way she described uh, her mother reminded me a lot of Linda. And I thought when I wrote about Linda that I was like, aha, Bruce kind of married his mother, like a version of it. Um, and so I never would have been able to make that connection unless I had had Phoebe give me a kind of very vivid description of what Grace how Bruce's mother was like. What Bruce was like during his childhood movies was he was um, hyperactive, like he kept climbing on sets. They had to give him hand games to calm him down. But he loved making movies. That was the one thing that his mother could get him to do. Like getting him up to go to school was a, a huge chore. But they filmed in Hong Kong in the middle of the night to avoid the sound because it's a big city. And they, he would get up immediately at 2 or 3 in the morning and go off because he loved making movies so much. And it gave me a real sense of who Bruce Lee was as an actor. We think of him primarily as a martial artist because we look at the last four movies he made. But he made 20 non-kung fu movies before he was 18. Comedies, melodramas. He was kind of the Macaulay Culkin of Hong Kong. And so I got a sense of Bruce the actor, the artist, who becomes the martial artist who becomes the martial arts actor as he merges those two passions. Two of the students I interviewed I was most happy to interview was Dan Inosanto and Taki Kimura. Um, and one, you get a sense of how much they loved Bruce Lee. Uh, and sometimes you wonder when people talk 
lovingly about it? Is it only because, you know, Bruce Lee's famous and they don't want to seem like they're talking bad about, you know, a famous guy? But when you sit down with someone, you get a sense of what the, how much loyalty they still feel to him to this day. And Taki Kimura told me something very interesting, which was, he basically said, I was the one that convinced Bruce to marry Linda. <laughs> and 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 that there's a certain moment in Linda's book where she's she doesn't quite come out and say it, but that Bruce wasn't certain whether he should marry her or not, um, and he had to he was thinking about it and he consulted with Tacky, and Tacky's reached an age where he I think he was a little more open. And he just was like I told Bruce she's she's deep she has character you won't find someone better and you should marry her and that was one of those details if you hadn't gone to the interview you never would have picked up. Guru Dan in Asanto. He was one of the very first people I talked to. And of course, he was Bruce's uh, teacher, of uh, uh, assistant teacher at his LA school. Uh, and one of the things I liked was Guru Dan's uh, sense of humor. Uh, so he, I was asking him about Bruce Lee's sort of Jeet Kune Do philosophy of using no way is way, of using no limit is limit, and he goes, well, it was the 60s, we all talk like that. Uh, and so he had a kind of self-deprecating sense of humor, which I thought was delightful. Um, and I asked him, one of the questions I asked him was, you know, I said, Guru Dan, you used to be a driving instructor, what did you think of Bruce's driving? And he laughed and he said, <laughs> he goes, Bruce terrified me, because he, so, he was so fast behind the wheel. But even worse was when I was driving, because Bruce would always criticize everything that I did. Yeah. Uh, and so I, you got a sense of who Bruce Lee was as a person, and not just as a sort of icon. You know, I relied a lot on the Steve McQueen biography written by Marshall Terrell. Um, he was actually one of my first mentors. So he and I started talking about the relationship between McQueen and Bruce, which is very much a kind of older brother, younger brother, sibling kind of rivalry, as they both were competing to see who was better than the other. Uh, and so this was one of the sort of stories that, that got in there, especially the fact that uh, there was a kind of love triangle between the two of them involving another actress. And that was something that had never been reported before. And it struck me, um, we'd known for a long time Bruce wanted to be a bigger star than Steve McQueen, but that there was also a very almost high school aspect to it, uh, that they both had liked the same girl. Uh, so I interviewed Ip Chun, who was Ip Man's oldest son. Uh, he's Ip Man's son. I, I'm not quite certain the, the ranking. Um, and I, my, the thing I liked most about Ip Chun, the, the question he answered was, I said, how is it your, that your father is now sort of famous because there's been all these Ip, Ip Man movies? When, in truth, when Ip Man was an instructor, he was a very, he was a minor instructor. Wing Chun was not a major style, even in Hong Kong at that time. Uh, Charlie Fat and Hungar were much bigger. And he said, it's great. My father is bigger than Bruce Lee now. <laughs> and I said, uh, hold on, mate. <laughs> I'm not sure he's bigger than Bruce Lee. <laughs>